So, so far we've been talking about um, describing motion, um, like the kinematic equations um, that describe uh, constant acceleration motion, um, and the single equation that describes constant velocity motion. Uh, but I want to get into um, uh, explaining motion, right? Why do things move with constant velocity, or why do things move with constant um, acceleration? Um, and uh, several um, scientists and philosophers in the past have thought about this same idea. Um, so I want to talk about um, Aristotle. Aristotle was a 4th century Greek, 4th um, century BC um, Greek philosopher who um, noticed that when you push an object, it stops. And if you want it to keep going, you have to keep pushing it. Right? And so he argued the natural state for an object is for it to be at rest, or for it to come to rest. Um, that's maybe a little narrow. Um, Galileo in the 17th century is an Italian scientist. Um, he proposed a thought experiment. He said, well, what if we could imagine a slicker surface, or what if we had, you know, wheels? I think he was specifically thinking of maybe ice, but um, but what if we had wheels? Well, I could give this thing a push, and it no longer comes to rest as fast. And so he proposed a thought experiment. What if the wheels were perfect? Or what if that um, the second interaction, right, the the surface on surface interaction, um, were more perfect? He argued that the object would continue to go in a straight line with a constant speed. Um, so he's arguing that would be a better model for the natural state of an object. Um, uh, it also introduced you, uh, he also introduced the idea that um, the property of an object that re resists change in uh, motion, change in velocity, is um, inertia, this idea of inertia. Um, and uh, Isaac Newton actually... Um, I think maybe a hundred years later, um, proposed the idea of forces. Um, and this is something you've probably heard before, the idea of Newton's laws of motion. Um, and that's where I want to go now. So Newton's laws of motion. So uh, Newton agreed that the natural state for an object is um, for it to be uh, moving in constant velocity motion, right? He agreed that um, that an, an object that is undisturbed would either stay at rest, which is which is uh, what Aristotle said, or move with constant velocity. Um, and that's what Galileo said. So we can um, introduce that, right? Uh, and so he said, when forces are balanced on an object. Okay, so what's a force? Well, we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, but he's suggesting if there is no net force on an object, it travels in straight line, constant speed motion, which would also be constant velocity, right? Velocity is... Um, is speed plus the direction. So if the direction is unchanged and the speed is unchanged. That's constant velocity motion. Um, again, the quality of an object that causes it to resist change in motion is something we call inertia. Um, so that's Newton's first law. Newton's second law has to do with what an object does when there is a net force. So if there is a net force on an object, that object accelerates in an inverse proportion to its mass, right? Specifically, F equals MA. Um, and I'll write that again in a minute. That's actually a vector equation. So the acceleration is the same direction as the force, and it's inversely proportional to mass, which means if, if you have a fixed force for a larger mass, the acceleration is smaller, right? So mass is kind of that um, inertia term. Um, okay, um, Newton's second law is kind of the workhorse for uh, for this idea 
Um, what we're getting into is dynamics. So again, we're explaining motion. We're not just describing it. Um, and Newton's third law is for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And that statement of Newton's third law is um, clunky to me. It, it feels like it doesn't mean anything. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Um, I like to think of it this way. Forces come in pairs. All right, so every force in the universe is matched up with another force that is equal to it and opposite in direction from some other object on some other object. Um, this is like saying when I push on the wall, the wall pushes back on me. Um, we will, we'll talk more about that um, in a little while as well. Uh, so let's get into what, what are forces? What forces are there? And um, actually, I'll just stay on this. What forces are there? And how do you, how do we describe them? Here, okay. So I want to come up with a list of forces. And this is by no means exhaustive, but it is going to be um, uh, there, there are a good number here. Um, it'll, it'll get us pretty far. That's what I mean to say. So, um, what force causes things to fall? Well, it's a force that we call gravity. Um, here I'm going to call it weight. So weight is um, is the force of gravity. So weight, I'll put in gravity in uh, parentheses. Right. So this is the uh, force that causes things to fall. Um, it always acts straight down, right, straight toward the center of the Earth, and we can describe it mathematically as m times g where g is the acceleration due to gravity, and m is an object's mass. This is the beginning of a hint of why different massed objects fall at the same rate, right? Because remember, um, when you remove the air, a bowling ball and a feather fall at the same rate. Um, and that's that seems crazy, but their weights, um, their masses are different, but that means the force due to gravity on them is also different, if, if this is the description. Right, so the bowling ball has a bigger mass, so it has a bigger force due to gravity, um, and that gives it the same acceleration as the feathers, which have a smaller mass, which means they have a smaller force due to gravity on them. Um, so let's make those go away. Um, so that's one force. Um, another force we can talk about is the force due to a um, due to a rope. Right, this is tension. So again, this is the force due to a rope or a chain or a string. Um, it's always a pull and it's always the same on either side of the rope. So if I have um, two objects connected by a rope that has tension in it, so let's put an object here, object one, and maybe a bigger, like different object here. If there's tension in this rope, there's tension pulling this way and tension pulling this way. That's the same size on both sides, right? That's how tension works. Okay. Um, what else? What force caused the, um, the cart to stop when I pushed it the first time? It's friction, right? So friction is another force. Um, friction is always um, parallel to a surface. It's 
always parallel to a surface. All right, so when I pushed the cart to the left, friction was acting to the right to slow it down. Um, in fact, that type of friction always acts against velocity. Um, that's a type of friction we call kinetic friction. Kinetic friction is the friction on a moving object, right? So it's um, when something is sliding, um, that's what acts to slow the sliding. So I'll say always against a velocity vector. So I'll just say V. All right, and kinetic friction acts to slow things down. There's another kind of friction, um, and that is, um, imagine that I have the cart at rest and I give it a very gentle push and it doesn't move. All right, that means I need to push harder, right? But why is it not moving when I give it that gentle push? Well, the answer is, um, is uh, there's friction preventing it from moving. That is static friction. Static friction prevents slipping. All right, and that's the way I like to say it. Um, and I might even be able to, to write that. Um, uh, come on. Because static friction can actually um, accelerate objects. If you imagine um, a box sitting on your uh, dashboard, right? If you speed up too fast, um, that box will slide back like into your lap, right? But if you speed up um, slowly, um, fr static friction will prevent the box from slipping against your dashboard and will accelerate the object. So static friction can prevent motion, but it can also cause acceleration. Um, but either way, it's preventing slipping of two surfaces against each other. Okay, um, and there's one, maybe two more I want to talk about. Um, there's another force, right? So when, when the um, cart was sitting on the desk, um, it's not falling, right? Is it not falling because it has no weight? Well, no, the gravity's still acting on it, but there's another force acting against gravity, and that's the upward force of the table pushing back on the cart. That's a normal force. And a normal force is always perpendicular to a surface. All right, it's a force that prevents objects from passing through each other. And in fact, if you look at these two, these two forces, the normal force and frictional force um, make up surface interactions, right? Because um, one of them is parallel, the other one's perpendicular. So um, those two together are sufficient to describe every surface interaction that we talk about. Um, and there's one other force um, that we'll sometimes talk about, and that's drag, which is like air resistance. Um, typically in problems we say ignore air resistance. Um, there are cases where you can't, uh, generally when you're moving very fast. Um, so drag actually is proportional to velocity. Uh, there are models where it's proportional to velocity squared. Sometimes it's proportional to velocity cubed, depending on the fluid that you're moving through. Um, but that's beyond the scope of this course. Um, OK, so let's, um, let's practice identifying some forces. So let's just go to the handout. So let's just work pro uh, um, example number one. So you look up from your textbook and observe a spider motionless above you, suspended from a strand of silk from the ceiling. You distract yourself by identifying the forces acting on the spider. What are they? Let's identify some, some forces. So I'm going to draw this situation. Um, there's my ceiling. No, I don't want it to be red. 
So that's the ceiling. There's the spider silk. And here's the spider. And of course, I've got to give it eight little legs. So the question is, what are the forces acting on that spider? Um, okay. So um, what I like to do is draw a little circle around the spider. Why would we draw a circle around the spider? Because um, this helps us identify contact forces. Anything that um, intersects the circle is a potential source of force, right? So this string, that's tension, right? That string is supplying tension. So I'll say the force is acting here. Tension is one of them. Um, and that's a contact force. Uh, and tension is kind of acting against gravity, right? Gravity is not a contact force. It is a, a long distance force. There's another long distance force we'll talk about in physics too, which is um, electromagnetic forces. Um, but in this course, the only non-contact force is gravity. So gravity is acting, I could call it gravity or weight. It doesn't really matter. Um, and so here's the, the point of the dotted line. Um, it's tempting to say, well, the string is attached to the ceiling, so isn't the ceiling su uh, supplying some kind of force? And the answer is yes, but to the, s to the um, silk, right? Um, and the question is, what are the forces on the spider? So the ceiling's not acting directly on the spider. The, the spider silk is acting on the spider. So these are the only two forces. Um, okay, that's good. Let's do example number two here. Um, Example number two says a skier is sliding down a 15 degree slope. Friction is not negligible. Identify the forces on the skier. So again, let's draw a picture of this situation. Um, so let's change to black and just draw the hill. Um, draw as 15 degree as we can. That's probably good enough. Um, and then we need to draw a skier, so let's start with, I don't know, the skis. And there's this like ski pole, and I don't know, a hat because it's probably cold. Okay, great. So what are the forces acting? And we're not drawing them here yet, uh, we're just listing them. Um, so the forces. Well, there's weight for sure. Unless we're like very far from a, a large body like the Earth or a planet or the sun, unless we're very far from one of those objects, weight will always be a thing, right? And if the problem is set on the surface of the Earth, weight will be there for sure, right? Um, and so the rest of the forces have to be contact forces. So I'll drop my little circle here. And then we see, oh, well, clearly there's going to be a normal force and there's going to be a frictional force because we're touching this surface. Um, we're not going through it, but gravity wants to push us through it. So normal has got to be acting there. So there's a normal force. If friction is not negligible, then friction's also there. Um, and then probably drag. And that's probably it. Right? And again, I like to point out these two forces make up the um, the surface interactions. If I were going to draw those forces on here, friction would be acting up the hill, and normal would be acting this way. Gravity is acting like straight down this way, and drag, like air resistance, is probably doing the same thing as um, friction at the surface. Um, okay. So um, I, this is actually a taste of, um, of one way of representing all of the forces on an object, um, all of these arrows coming off of this skier, uh, but we'll see that in a future video. So thanks for watching.